Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Bucky Kennedy Podcast. And if you're listening on the radio, we're glad to have you today. Today, we've got a special guest, Jeff Christensen. He serves as the senior pastor at Calvary Chapel in Glenwood, Springs, Colorado. He is the current president of the International Association of Biblical Counselors, professor of biblical counseling at Calvary Chapel University, and the founder and chair of the Biblical Counseling Academy, uh, where he serves as the dean of biblical counseling and soul care. Uh, Jeff, it is good to have you with us today. Uh, I mean, thanks for joining us all the way from Colorado. So I've introduced you uh, according to your bio. Uh, Give us a little glimpse as to who you are and how you got to where you are today. (laughs) Yeah, thank you, Bucky. So blessed to be here with you. You know, those bios are, uh, you have to put all that together in a bio, but really, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, helping others uh, follow him as well. And just like you, that's really what uh, my heart is. I'm not as much of a Uh, an academic researcher as I am a pastor helping people uh, walk with Jesus. And, you know, we live in troubling times. So I have found when, you know, when I was studying to be a pastor, I resonated with the great commission, you know, go therefore let's make disciples. And as we're going or wherever we're going, make disciples. And I saw in the biblical counseling arena, that's exactly what that is. It's one-on-one personal uh, ministry and discipleship. And I was attracted to that because I wanted to help people flourish or walk down that path of discipleship. So that's really a synopsis of where my heart is and and what I've been doing. Well, you know, Jeff, uh, I first came across you, uh, I guess it's Harbinger, Harbinger TV now is what it's called. Uh, it used yeah. to be Trusted Videos, and uh, I started listening to you, and man, really enjoyed uh, how your synopsis and grasp of uh, how to help people where they were in counseling. And uh, there's a lot going on in our world today. I mean, this is a broad subject. You know, I, I'm I'm a little d- deep south, and we say it's kind of like chewing an oyster. The more you chew, the bigger it gets, <laughs> and that kind of goes into what we see in the area of biblical counseling and even what has been described as a mental health crisis in our country. So I kind of want to start there because we, uh, in preparing for a show, we talked a little bit about definitions and understandings and things like that. So when you hear mental health crisis or mental health problems in general, what are we really defining there? What's, what's the scope of work we're talking about? Well, you know, you know, you could, you could just open up, your your news app for example i read uh recently in the wall street journal this is 2024 that 92 million prescriptions for medications like clonopin and xanax uh are are being prescribed because people are frazzled and people are anxious and people are troubled and we live in a troubled world there's no doubt about it that our world is uh is really topsy-turvy right now if you look at uh, the wars that are going on whether in the middle east or the threat of uh you know taiwan and china or what's going on in the ukraine and the threat of further war uh what's happening in our own united states with the the division politically uh, you know, what's happening in the, in health and people are struggling with that. And so I understand the topic of, uh, mental health, which used to be really mental hygiene and, and just wanting to have a good mental outlook on life. Well, it's, it's shifted. The secular culture has shifted it to this topic called mental illness and it really is a a different definition that the biblical worldview would place on it because we understand there's a difference between the mind and uh, and the brain, the physical organ of the brain. And so we're 
we're going to approach things a lot different than the the secular naturalist that is going to say there's not a much of a difference that the that the the brain secretes thoughts the way the liver secretes bile they don't see the the soul the immaterial the non-organic component of the human being the way we do what the bible describes anthro as, as an biblical anthropology that that we're we're a twofold being we're a material and immaterial and yes there are uh so many nuances about that whole thing uh but there needs to be you know a real uh distinction on definitions like you said between a worldview that we hold as bible believing christians and what the secular worldview would hold uh, concerning mental uh, mental health mental illness things like that yes it's a troubled world we live in but the answers that we have are going to be different than the answers that the world gives well in in, in the end i mean that was astounding when you just give out those statistics of uh how we go right to a pill in that deal and so i mean we can get in a whole conversation as to the pharmaceuticals of that we'll we'll say that for another time yeah but the the reality of it is what you're discussing is how how believers would look at a situation versus a non-believer and it and that distinction is sometimes we live in our world right now that distinction gets blurred because you have a lot of churches out there talking about self-care and you're enough uh all these terms out there and it really does put the onus on the individual that says that you know i'm the most valuable thing on the planet uh so i i don't need to be struggling like this and if i'm struggling something's wrong with me and and there is and i would tell them well there's a sin problem that's going on too so until you deal with sin uh, you're always going to struggle some other things. And of course, there's a lot of pushback with that. But to your definition point, even in that, I mean, the definition for homosexuality, uh, it's changed in the last 50 years. It was considered a mental illness, but it's always fluid. They're always, the world is always changing, it seems, the definitions to meet the acceptance of the culture. Uh, so as we talk about this, I mean, I, I really resonate with what you're saying here uh, because I, I still say that, the answer to all our questions is found in Jesus, his word, uh, the Holy Spirit, and that is the best resource we have. Uh, but it just seems like it's a forgotten resource, an ignored resource or whatever. So when I hear all this self-care going on right now, uh, what does that do for us in the church when we make self the king of our hearts? Yeah, you know, and again, like you were saying, I mean, we see... We see people in our culture that are looking for help and they're finding answers not in the right place. They're finding the wrong answers, but there's there are real people with real struggles, depression, nervous breakdowns, stress upon stress, family issues, uh, things like cancer and 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 real health issues that are people are really struggling and so they're getting answers and they're finding those answers aren't fulfilling they're not they're not bringing what they need what do they need uh they need jesus and like you said i, I want to go to luke 9 23 jesus was gathered there with them all he then he said to them all luke 9 23 the curious onlookers the scoffers, the Pharisees, the on fire disciples, the entire cross section of humanity was represented in, in this passage of scripture, Luke 9, 23. He said to them all, everybody there, curious onlookers, whoever they were, women, children, men, the all the nationalities, everybody was there. And he said, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. So the answer to what people are looking for is exactly what you said, Bucky, is it's Jesus. And he's saying that to every listener right now. 
whatever you're struggling with, whatever your trouble is, he's saying, come unto me, you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. The answer is not in a solution that the secular world or scientists might have. The answer is in a person and his name is Jesus. And I love to point people to this passage that the number one thing when we come to Jesus, here are the terms. What are the terms? No to self. Instead of uh, yes to self or the self hyphenated words like self-esteem or even self-care. Yeah, we care for ourselves. Uh, you know, we want to be healthy and not unwise, but there's perspective. We want to primarily say no to the independent self-life. That's what the self is, independent from God. And we want to turn from that and turn toward God, say no to it. And it gets even better. It's, it's not only no to self, but take up your cross, which speaks of death to self, where Paul said, mm -hmm. I've been crucified with Christ. It, there's a identification with the cross. But the result is when we do that, there's newness of life where we identify with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he says in that passage, deny himself, take up his cross daily. What's left, it says, and follow me. And so we, you and I, those that are listening, we're calling people to come follow Jesus. I'm following it, him. And that's where the answer is. And he will give the wisdom. He will give the guidance. And not only that, he'll give the empowering, uh, the, the wherewithal, the resource, the heavenly resource. Ephesians speaks of uh, all the riches that are ours in heaven are available for us to walk in all he's called us to to be and to do and to navigate the potholes of this crazy stressful uh nerve-wracking culture we live in uh, the answer is going to always come back to a person named Jesus and and uh, that's where we're calling people to uh, not to underestimate the trials, the tribulation, the difficulty, the hurts, the pain, uh, the anxieties, the depressions, the difficulties that people are going through. However, we want to describe it. We want, though, to uh, let people know the answer is in Jesus. I want to go back to what you said there, because a lot of times when people hear biblical counseling and you gave a great answer right there, the answer is always in Jesus and what that means Sometimes, especially if you're talking with somebody and they're really in the midst of a hot and heavy trial, they're, they're, they're fighting anxiety or depression, tooth and nail, uh, they say, but you're not listening to me. I mean, I got a real problem here. It's almost at times that it, we come across sometimes as saying, no, but here that they feel like they're being minimalized or they're, that we're saying to them, no, you're not really going through what you're going through. And that's not what we're saying at all because these are real things. People do yeah. get anxious. People do get depressed and people do get wearied and angry and all these things. So we're not saying these things aren't real. Uh, so when you hear that, because a lot of that happens in biblical counseling uh, where people go, but I need more than a Bible verse. I need more than just follow Jesus. Uh, my problems are bigger than that. Uh, how do you address that? Where do you start in that deal? Because again, it seems like self has got the seat is on the, is on the throne and we don't understand what they're going through. There's gotta be more than the word of God to fix this. Well, you know, and that's, that's exactly why uh, the Lord had me launch the biblical counseling Academy is I believe we need to train up an army of disciple makers or soul care workers. I call them biblical counselors. We can, we can title them any way we want, but there's the public ministry and proclamation, the exposition of the word from the pulpit that, that touches and changes and uh, uh, helps people walk with the Lord. But then there's the one-on-one -on -one discipleship ministry. And then there's the personal ministry of the word where you're 
you're alone with the Lord in your morning devotions. Uh, so there's the public ministry, the the personal ministry, and then there's the private ministry. And so I think I think the reason people do need somebody to talk to, they need somebody to pour their heart out. One of the things about a, a good biblical counselor is they're like Jesus and they listen. The woman at the well, uh, Jesus, if you look at that passage in the scripture, if you have a red letter edition, it, it's red letters and then a lot of black letters because she's talking and then he's listening and he asks some good questions and then he listens. It's it's red letters, black letters, red letters. But So there's a lot of listening going on that's Christ-like care. And we need to hear the matter. Uh, Proverbs 18, 13. We'd be foolish to give an answer to somebody without first listening. So I think people need mentorship. I don't like to use the word, word mentorship as much as discipleship. Anybody mm -hmm. can be a mentor. Only uh, biblical Christians can do biblical discipleship. And I like that term. It's more pinpointed and accurate and so people need discipleship and the first thing i find out is is i get people plugged into the local church because we're committed to the local church and uh plugged into a prayer time and meeting uh disciple them and reading their word uh chapter by chapter going through a morning devotion uh teaching them to learn how to to worship the lord in song how to be give a contribution, whether financially or in more than just financially, uh, to share their faith uh, evangelistically, to do the work of evangelism. And, and you just walk with them through their trial, even as uh, the Psalms would teach. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you're with me. He doesn't just snatch me out of that valley. And I go through the trial, as do all of us. I just have to recognize Jesus is, is walking with me. And he has the answers. And so it's not, here's a verse called me in the morning. It's spending time in discipleship. Are you seeing that it's becoming more and more difficult to raise up disciples or are churches just not as engaged in doing it? Or is it both of those things? Both. Yeah. I don't think people, you know, I, as a pastor of a church, I think people are busy. They're, they're too busy to engage in being equipped to do the work of discipleship. They got their own stuff going on. They're trying to earn a living. Uh, they're trying to pay the bills, pay the rent. Uh, and then, you know, obviously life with children and sports and events and everything crowds out what his, history, culturally, uh, there was a lot more people willing to be discipled. And, you know, frankly, not all churches are uh, into discipleship. That's not, the, they're not, they're not doing that work. Uh, a lot of them are, though. A lot of them want to, but the, people just aren't showing up yeah. um, you can tell right away when somebody comes in for crisis counseling that they're just not walking with jesus they're just they don't have a walk they're not showing up to church they're not showing up to prayer meetings uh that's the first thing i plug them in they're and if they're not doing that i really can't help them if they're not willing to show up and get the help that they need um, but yeah you're right there's it's both yeah, because and sometimes it really is, Jeff. What I found is when you're talking to people and you start walking them down this road and and kind of trying to inventory about where they are spiritually, uh, mm -hmm. trying to find a baseline for their spiritual health. Yeah. Uh, you really, you really have to walk through with them uh, because there's a lot of self justification there. Well, I'm I'm not as bad. I know I'm I'm not doing good, but you know, and then they go through the litany. I read my Bible. I'm praying. I'm going to church, you know. Uh, and I, I was preaching this in a sermon because I'm preaching through the Sermon on the Mount, where you know Jesus says, "Unless your righteousness exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees," you know, and and which is a major thing because they would say all those things too. They would say all the things that we're doing, and Jesus is looking at them and say, "Well, you're not fit for the kingdom of heaven." So there's this heart issue here. 
And really, I found as a pastor of 40 years trying to get people to understand that heart dynamic uh, that we are, uh, you know, body, spirit, soul. We got this thing what working on us that there's there's a there's a spirit within us that has to be regenerated by the Holy Spirit for us to be aware of that. And we've raised up a whole generation in which some of these terms I mean, you might as well be speaking a, a whole other language to them at times. Yeah. This issue of when we're dealing with somebody and you're talking to them and they get hung up on all the stuff they do and they can't understand after doing all that they're doing, which in their mind is the right stuff to do, why are they still having the problems that they're having? How do you handle that? Well, you know, I, you know, one passage of scripture that comes to mind is, is, uh, is John uh, chapter 15. And where he says, um, abide in me and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself and unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. So the doctrine or the teaching of abiding, and it's the very life and work and presence and ministry of the indwelling Lord Jesus Christ working in a person. And, you know, that's really, I think, the meat of the word. I understand, you know, how to do things for Jesus or for the kingdom or in the church. Just give me a checklist, a punch list. I'll make it happen. You know, I'm a veteran and I'm a military guy. I know how to get things done. But the kingdom of God is walking in humility and relying on and trusting in and depending on another to do that work. And so in, in the uh, passage of scripture, uh, he, he says this, that uh, without me, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit for without me, you can do nothing. And, you know, that is really what Jesus means. Nothing. Zilch. Zero. Nada. Whatever language we want to say it, there's no eternal fruit that can be born out of my life. And we know that passage in Galatians, you know, the, the fruit of the Spirit. Those are the things that I want to produce but I can't do that on my own. It has to be the abiding relationship with Jesus Christ. And I think it has a lot to do with what you were speaking of during the break is that the difference between belief and unbelief, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief Yes. Uh, that, that it would be you at work upon me, in me and through me for your good pleasure for, for you at work. And, and I think a, a lot of people want need to grow into that area. I certainly do. And I don't think any of us have arrived, but but I want to help people grow in their dependence on the Lord Jesus Christ as 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 he's the branch, I'm the vine. Without him I could do nothing or I'm the branch, he's the vine. And if I'm a if I'm a branch that's cut off, well there's nothing left. Yeah. Uh, I I have no I can't draw upon the vine, the life uh, the the source the resource that I need to produce fruit um, out here in Colorado we have vineyards and you know in Georgia you have peach trees you know <laughs> peach state you're gonna have beautiful luscious and I've been uh, I've had some of the good peach pie and the peaches and you know can you imagine going out to the orchard the peach the orchard and uh, during you know, the season where the peaches are blossoming and blooming and, and growing and you don't, you don't hear them straining and striving and moaning the trees. It's just a natural flowing process. And that's how it is to be with us. We're not, you know, striving in our uh, own ability to produce fruit. It's a natural uh, 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 flow from the vine through the branch producing fruit. That's how I like to explain it yeah. uh, in that way. Jesus explained it. 
I think, I, I think the fruit bearing thing is all good. What we don't like is the pruning stuff. You know, yeah. when, yeah. when, you know, we get a lot of, we get a lot of leaves and stuff going around there. not supposed to be there. We're dropping to the ground or whatever. And uh, we got to get comfortable being a vine in the dirt and not a vine producing. Yeah. Uh, and then that pruner comes around there and first uh, recognizing pruning and then identifying what needs to be pruned. Cause sometimes I have to, God will put me in a situation where I've got to recognize what needs to be pruned in order for it to get pruned. Yeah. And uh, if I'm not there, because what you said is so true, I can't do anything of my own capability that God would be glorified or honored in. I mean, I can be busy doing a lot of things, but there's a difference between being active and being pleasing to the Lord and producing fruit. So, uh, so how do we get in this time of pruning where, because it really does, I mean, this is where our faith gets tested yeah. a great deal in uh, what it is. And so I tell people sometimes, you know, Christianity is not nearly as complicated. It's mainly costly. So uh, we make it complicated when we're trying to negotiate a cost. So because uh, we get comfortable in our rebellion, we can get comfortable and uh, we can't, you know, nobody loves me like me. You know, Terrell Owens, that great theologian and football player, said, I love me some me. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, how do we help people there without coming across? And this is the thing is that we're lovingly without judgment or condemnation, but in truth and in love, uh, helping them understand, hey, there's some pruning that's got to take place. Uh, you're not as fruitful as you should be or could be because you got some weeds in your life. Yeah. Uh, how do you walk people through that process? Yeah, that's a, that's great. Uh, uh, question illustration that you're sharing, you know, and, you know, moving to Colorado, I was on a uh, Bible college campus and very fruitful season of my life. Uh, I really loved what God was doing, uh, growing my new family. And I was, um, uh, a Bible teacher, multiple classes and campus pastor really loved it. And an open door came for me to move and plant a church in Colorado. And the passage of scripture was exactly what you shared. Um, yes, Jeff, you're, you're bearing fruit, but those who bear fruit, I prune right here in John 15. Yeah. And I thought, I don't, I'm not interested in getting pruned, <laughs> you know, and I'll never remember my pastor came and I shared with him. There's an open door. I really don't want to go through that open door. The Lord is showing me that it's going to be a pruning season for me. And he said, well, read the rest of the verse. And I, Cause I got stuck right there. Those who bear fruit, I pruned and mm -hmm. I didn't read the rest of it until I went back and I looked again and I thought, Oh, those who bear fruit, I prune so that they might bear more fruit. Right. That's what you were saying and uh, reminding me of that testimony. And sometimes I'm thinking I'm still waiting for that more fruit to come, Lord. <laughs> but people, uh, God's not arbitrary in the pruning process. God has his glory in mind. God has a purpose in mind, an eternal purpose that more fruit would be born through that pruning season. And I've learned when I make, so a lot of biblical counseling is simply about decision making in the will of God. People come and they're, they're torn. What decisions do I make? I, I have this before me. And sometimes they're just really good, godly decisions, and they don't know what to do to, to step into the mission field or to go on staff at a local church or to step off of staff and go into the secular mm -hmm. world or get married to somebody. Everybody has decisions about life. And, and a lot of times I like to ask the question, where is the cross of Jesus Christ in this equation? Wow. Is there a death to self? Is there a no to self? Is there, are, am I crucified with Christ? It is no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives 
in me. In the life I live in this flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and he gave himself for me. Am I including in that a, a no to self, a death to self, a pruning in my decision-making process? People don't add that equation. It's like, I want comfort. I yes. want smooth sailing. And, and when I pray, I'm praying, Lord, no problems. You know, make it smooth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Get everything, get all the obstacles out of the way. You know, we want a, a, a real estate for administrative purposes. Lord, you know, remove all the obstacles. Make this a smooth transaction. And that yet the Lord sees fit to bring uh, difficulties and trials and total impossibilities. But Paul would say it this way. I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, to what happened to us in Asia. You know, we were hard pressed on every side. I mean, things were coming down. But it was so that I would no longer learn to trust in myself, but I would learn to trust in a God who raises the dead. And sometimes we're so caught up in trusting our own abilities, our own ingenuity, our own intellect, our own where I can do this. And we then go through a trial. So we learn I can't do it. And I have to trust in him who raises the dead. I have to turn my trust from self-trust to trust in God. And I think that's all about belief versus unbelief. Lord, uh, I need to trust you more. And sometimes we help those that we minister to get to that place. And it's not flicking a switch. It's not overnight. It takes discipleship and time and patience and walking with people and caring for people and that parakaleo ministry of the coming alongside uh, walking with them, not just the nuthateo ministry, the admonishing, you know, ministry, the con confrontation yeah. about sin, but sometimes comforting people and walking with them, uh, helping them through their trials to see that God has a purpose in it. And that purpose typically is that we wouldn't trust in ourselves, but in, in a Christ that uh, lives in us. Yeah, you know, and, and I love that because one of the questions that I get asked all the time when I share my testimony, uh, I I came out of uh, I was a, a bouncer at a bar, uh, I, I was everything that you would describe in the party lifestyle and all this kind of stuff, and uh, grew up in church. I mean, I wasn't a, a stranger to church. You know, I tell people I had a terrible drug problem. My mom drugged me to church every Sunday. So, <laughs> uh, but you know, I had all that. But then. Uh, well, God saved me, and uh, and I, I used to say God radically saved me, but salvation is always radical. I mean, it yeah. really is. There's never a salvation that's not radical, and so immediately the the alcohol was gone, all the other stuff was, and people would say, you know, but I don't understand it. How did you get delivered so quickly? Uh, I'm I still struggle. I mean, I know I'm saved, but but I, I still want to do these things. You seem like you came out of the bar room and went to the pulpit and there was no time lapse. There was no struggle. There was no anything like that. Why is it that you can do that? And I can't do that. And you know, there, you know, there's that Damascus road experience. So we all look like Paul, you know, and you know, but we forget all that Paul had to go through in those missionary journeys, uh, between the Damascus road and everything else that he went through. Uh, so, how how do you tell these people say listen i know what god did in my life and i know a little bit of your story and uh what god did in your life but when you're sitting there and there's a person that's struggling like you were as a lost person they believe that god saved them but their experience doesn't look the same and i always tell them don't look at me look at the cross look at jesus your your eyes are in the wrong place uh walk us into that into that space yeah, you know, and and my story, uh, people know that God rescued me from a, a a treacherous, you know, lifestyle. I was, you know, I was a knucklehead, and and I like to use the term that I think I think it was Jerry Bridges. I'm not sure who said it. Uh, but he said it, it's a, no, I can't remember the name of the author, a long obedience in the same direction. 
Mm. Because I was looking at a lot of my friends and they would, they would backslide. They would get, they would find a little bit of help and hope and, and life and church and Christ and in the word. And then they would backslide. And I would always say, you know, here's how God rescued me. I mean, it was 10 years of a long obedience in the same direction. It was just yeah. stepping and stepping and stepping and not stepping back. Because the, when you start stepping back, it becomes a pattern and a bad habit. And so I would help people do that. It would be accountability, really. And 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 so you count the cost as a pastor, as a ministry leader, as a counselor, as a disciple maker. You count the cost because people uh, are are messy and you got to walk with them and work with them and 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 help them stumble forward yes so that they're not sliding back and going back into the vomit uh, that they were once in and that was the only thing that rescued me is 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 just continually baby steps baby steps baby steps and next thing you know the lord started using me and i can't even believe it even to this day that I've walked with him and haven't, uh, I haven't looked back, but that's all by, by the grace of God. There's nothing in and of myself because, but because I could tell you if, if it was, if I was that branch that was cut off and I did this on my own, it would be a disaster. Mm. So Jeff, here we are. I'm, I'm a pastor and I'm saying, man, I, I really love what you're talking about. I mean, cause I still think that the local church is where the ministry happens, where the help happens, the hope, the healing. I mean, uh, I pastor a church. I, I'm, I'm grateful for the local church. You know, people always go, what, you know, what does church make a difference for and all that kind of stuff like that. But I'm, I'm hearing you and I'm saying, all right, how do I do this? Where, where do I even start? If I'm going to start a discipleship ministry, a counseling ministry, a soul care ministry, mm -hmm. Where do I even begin? Are there resources I need to get? Are there people I need to get in touch with? How does that all work? Well, it's like it's like me, you know, it, it, Pastor. You know how your calendar fills up with discipleship counseling appointments, and that's why we have an academy that is digital that you can then get your people trained so that you trust them, that you can delegate to them, that they're, you're trusting that they're competent to counsel. And, you know, and, and also um, you, you have a conviction on the sufficiency of scripture, that the answers are not found in integrating secular psychology with the Bible. You, you would Proclaim that message from the pulpit. You don't want your disciple makers, small group leaders, counselors teaching a different message in the counseling room and the one-on-one -on -one than what you would share personally, privately, or even publicly. And so I think I think a lot of times is is um, getting people equipped by reading quality uh, books, introductory books on the subject. And then finding out, is there a gifting stirring? Is there a calling in my life to enter into that ministry, that opportunity? So I guess it really begins with you as the, the leader recognizing God's gifting and calling on across, you know, the congregation. And, you know, there are experts built right in. You see somebody that is an older couple that has walked with the Lord faithfully as a married couple through the ups and downs in their life. And they are walking with Jesus. They know the word right away. You recognize that's built in expert in marriage counseling right there, built into the very body, the fabric, uh, the one, another ministry built into the church. You recognize that you see that. And then, you know, you can delegate to them. And you can trust them or somebody that has walked through addictions or was a drunk and alcohol addicted and they've come through it and they're walking with Jesus. And, you know, you can point 
to that person. So do we need certification? Do we need degrees? Not necessarily. God has just saw fit biblically that is built right into the fabric of the body of Christ and you and the elders and the pastors know who those people are. We pay attention to that. And, you know, sometimes people say, hey, here I am. I needed to get equipped a little bit deeper because I, I think this is what I'm called to do. And then those are the people that will take it a step further. They'll read the books. They'll study the scriptures. Uh, they'll get further equipped to do the work of the ministry right there in the local body. They don't have to go anywhere. And, um, you know, set up, uh, you know, seminars and anything, you know, like a, a, a wow. summit at the local church. I'd love to, uh, I think we're talking about yeah. visiting, visiting Georgia one day yeah. and, you know, and, and doing a summit where we yeah. can train uh, leaders from and, and people that want to be discipled in this, in the entire community, in the surrounding cities that uh, where you're located. So any way that we can help uh, do that, we would love to. Well, you certainly helped today, and it's, I've enjoyed talking to you and uh, look forward to even bringing you to Gainesville, Georgia, on the beautiful shores of Lake Lanier. And yeah. uh, so I know that uh, our folks would love you. You certainly would be a benefit to us, and I'd enjoy hanging out with you a little bit. Uh, and then coming out to Colorado sometime. <laughs> Absolutely. There's a wide open door here. Now, if you if you like the winters, it's cold right now. No, I want uh, to come But there's to some summer, good skiing yeah. if you're – we're near Telluride Ski Resort, and I'm also the the church in Glenwood Springs is near Aspen. So there's some world class skiing, but uh, I don't know what the lift ticket prices are. I, I can't even afford them. But <laughs> <laughs> there's good powder. Whenever there's a storm, you got to fly in and and get that powder. The summers are epic if you like fly fishing. Uh, we're doing some uh, fly fishing. You know, and that's another thing with discipleship. I take leaders and frazzled pastors and we go out fly fishing and just get some rest away from it all. So anybody that's interested listening that would like to come out for a, a uh, what we have in, we call them intensives, you know, three day, just get out in the mountains and, yeah. and uh, get some, get some uh, time with Jesus in the wilderness of Colorado. But you've got a beautiful state where you're at right there in Georgia. So I wouldn't take people away from there. <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you, Jeff. We appreciate it again. Uh, thank you for listening. If you're listening on WDUN, we appreciate you listening to us today. If you're listening on the podcast at Buckingham Ministries, thank you so much. Uh, check out uh, Jeff Christensen and uh, Biblical Counseling, and uh, it'll bless you. You can, again, listen to his podcast on uh, Spotify, or you can go uh, just Google him. You'll find him and uh, he'll be there. So thank you, Jeff, for being with us uh, again. Thank you for being a part of Bucky Kennedy Ministries and we'll see you soon. For more content like today's podcast, click right here. For sermons, click right here. And again, please like, share, comment and subscribe. Have a blessed day.